Hello, everyone. So uh, this week, we're going to be building off of what we did last week, where we learned about chemical reactions and balancing chemical equations. Now we're going to be using these balanced chemical equations uh, to talk about reactions quantitatively. So for example, if I start out with 10 grams of reactant, how much product do I get? Okay, so that's kind of going to be the goal of this week. Um, it's going to incorporate a lot of what we've done throughout the semester, right? So uh, molar masses, ideal gas laws, talking about solutions, talking about balanced chemical equations, all of that is gonna come into play. Um, so if you find yourself struggling, it's a good idea to go back to when these concepts were first introduced. And I'll do my best to point you to where those would be when we get to those particular types of problems. Uh, so the first thing we're going to talk about is the mole ratios, which is a quantity that we can get from our balanced chemical uh, equations. But before we do that, I actually just want to take a step back and um, sort of review a lot of what we've done that falls under this umbrella of stoichiometry. Uh, most, of the chem most of the math that we do in a chemistry course, we consider to be stoichiometry which is when you're paying attention not only to the values, but also to the units of these quantities that you're working with. Remember, we line them all up in such a way that our units cancel out nicely. So we've talked about a few different types of um, quantities, and I just kind of want to review real quick so we have it all in our brains. So the first thing that we actually discussed is using this constants page and doing conversions, right? So for example, if I wanted to go from inches to centimeters, I would take this piece of information here and I would create a conversion factor from it. So that would look like if I wanted to go from, whoops, that's not a thing, inches to centimeters, for example, I would look that up and I'd get this conversion factor that says, right, so if we go back here, 2.54 centimeters to one inch. And so how I would use that you know, I take that line and I would set up this conversion factor 2.54 cm per one inch. I could use this to convert from inches to centimeters, or I could flip it upside down. And this would allow me to convert from centimeters to inches, right? And you know which one to use based on the units. I, I, I want to stress this so, so much in, this, in these types of math, in the math that we do in chemistry, are the units are so important. If your units all line up nicely and everything cancels out, that's great. That's how you know you've set it up correctly, okay? So first we had these like conversion factors. Let me actually move this over here, set this down a little bit, whoops. So these were these conversion factors that lets us jump from imperial to metric, right? So that was the first thing that we talked about was sort of uh, unit conversions. I guess we can be more specific, unit conversion factors, okay? We learned about these other quantities. So for example, density, the density of, you know, you could look it up for, it's different for each material. For example, for water, it's like 0 0.0998 grams per milliliter. And when you see something like this density, you want to immediately think of it in its math form and how you would use it as a conversion factor going from 0 0.998 grams per mil. This right here would help you jump from milliliters to grams or you could flip it upside down. And this right here would allow you to jump from grams to milliliters, right? So in much the same way that our unit conversion factors, this helped us go between inches and centimeters. Density allows us to go from grams, between grams and milliliters, okay? And hopefully, again, what I don't, I'm going over this and I want you to pay very close attention to the units. That's what really matters here, All right? Likewise, we talked about molar, that's not how you spell that, molar mass. So for example, if I go to my periodic table, I can look up the molar mass for neon. I have this number 20.1797, oops. Is 
that what I said, 20.1797? Yes. And this would be grams per mole for neon, right? So this is for neon. And again, when you see something like this, I want you to immediately be thinking in terms of how we use this in our math, which is 20.1797 grams of neon is equal to one mole of neon. Using it like this would help us go from moles to grams. I can also flip it upside down, one mole neon over 20.1797 grams of neon. This would help me go from grams of neon to moles of neon, right? So our molar mass allows us to convert between moles and grams. We can jump from either one. We can go from moles to grams or grams to moles using our molar mass. And then like, well, um, most recently we talked about solutions and how we can measure their concentration in molarity. So if I had something like 2.00 molar sodium chloride solution, again, your brain immediately wants to look at this and convert it into one of these conversion factors that we can actually use in our stoichiometry which would look like 2.00 moles sodium chloride per one liter, right? Big M stands for moles per liter. So using it like this, you could go from volume of solution to moles of solute, or you can flip it around one liter over 2.00 moles and ACL. This would help you go from moles of sodium chloride to liters of solution, right? So in this way, our solution concentration allows us to convert between volume and moles, okay? So uh, just the, sort of just a review, what I want to stress here is we read these quantities in our problems, right? We have these word problems that they'll give you a density or you'll get a molar mass or a concentration. And what you need to be in the habit of doing is converting them to one of these conversion factors, right? To being able to use it mathematically, quantitatively. And in addition, you have to know which one of these two factors you're gonna use based on the units that you want canceled, okay? All right, so again, we're gonna start by talking about mole ratios. This is information that you get from your balanced chemical equation, okay? Um, so for example, here from my balanced chemical equation, this says I've balanced this reaction right here. There's kind of a one here and a one here that I don't really put because it's a one, so we'd leave it off. And then this is two. So what this is saying is that one mole of disodium, uh, dinitrogen dioxide will combine with one mole of oxygen gas to create two moles of nitrogen dioxide. That's what my balanced chemical equation is telling me. So from this chemical equation, I can you know, kind of like mine this information from it about the ratio which with, with which reactants are consumed and products are produced. So what that might look like is from this chemical reaction, I can grab, or from this balanced chemical equation, I would build a conversion factor like one mole N2O2 per one mole O2, right? Because there's, there's these ones out front. Let me color code here. This one corresponds to this and this one corresponds to this, I get these mole ratios from my balanced chemical equation. And what this mole ratio is saying is that if one mole of oxygen gas is consumed, then one mole of dinitrogen dioxide is also consumed. So how do I use that? Well, let's say that I started out with, let me get rid of these colors because they're gonna be kind of distracting. Let's say that I told you that I started with 0.5 moles of O2. And I wanted to know how much of that dinitrogen dioxide is consumed. Well, I would use a mole ratio like this. And just like with all of our other stoichiometry factors, we have this beautiful cancellation of all of our units. We see the same thing here, where moles of O2 would cancel out. And I could figure out that half a mole of N2O2 was consumed. Oops, mole along with half a mole of oxygen gas, okay? So likewise, what if I said, 
I start out with 0 0.25 moles of the dinitrogen dioxide. And I want to know, all right, how many moles of nitrogen dioxide are produced? Right, that's kind of the kind of question that we're going to be asked in this chapter. Well, I know that I start out with 0 0.25 moles of N2O2. And then I need to jump from one side of my chemical equation to the other. That's what a balanced chemical equation does for you. From this balanced chemical equation, I can get that mole ratio that tells me that one mole of N2O2 will be consumed and generate two moles of nitrogen dioxide. And now I can punch it into my calculator just like I would any other problem. I would get 0 0.5. I'd have to put a zero on the end for sig figs. And now my units will work out beautifully such that moles NO2 cancel out and I'm left with moles nitrogen dioxide. Okay, so that's what your balanced chemical equation does for you. It allows you to get these mole ratios that tell you if one mole of N2O2 is consumed, then exactly two moles of NO2 are generated, right? Those ratios are like locked in there based on the chemical equation. So then this is uh, another one. This is two moles of carbon monoxide combined with one mole of O2 produces two moles of CO2. And then we've, so what we sort of see here is they've mined this information as a way to convert from carbon monoxide to carbon dioxide. So you see two moles of carbon monoxide per two moles of carbon dioxide or just like all of our other conversion factors that we talked about, you can flip it depending on which direction you're trying to go and go from moles carbon dioxide and uh, rather two moles carbon dioxide per two moles carbon monoxide. All right, so this is information. These mole ratios are information we're going to mine from our balanced chemical equation. All right, so urea can be synthesized in the laboratory by combining ammonia and carbon dioxide according to this equation. And they've given us this chemical equation and they've even balanced it for us, right? That might not be the case. It might be the case that we'd have to go in and balance it. In this case, it's actually already balanced. If it's not balanced, you can't use it in stoichiometry. But once it's balanced, we have this tool that we can use in stoichiometry. So let's try to answer these questions. So first of all, urea, just fun fact, is um, your body's way of getting rid of excess nitrogen. It converts it to urea, and then urea is something that you uh, excrete through your urine, actually. So a lot of your nitrogen waste products end up going through what's called the urea cycle, generating this guy right here, and then it leaves your body. Okay. So we're going to calculate the amount of urea. So we want to know how much of this is going to be produced if 5.2 moles of ammonia are consumed. All right, so this is what we're going to start with. 5.25, oh, 5.25, sorry, 5.25 moles of ammonia. Get to my calculator here. Okay. So 5.25 moles of ammonia. And then we want to bounce from one side of our chemical equation to another compound, right? So for that, we're going to use the mole ratio that we get from our balanced chemical equation, which tells me that two moles of ammonia are consumed to produce one mole of urea. I'm just going to write it out as urea because it's going to save me some time. So then we punch that into our calculator just like we would for all of the other type of calculations you do. 5.25 divided by two times one. You can even leave out the times one because of course that just makes it itself. And the calculator spits out 2.625. Now we're gonna go back and pay attention to units. Moles of ammonia cancel out and we're left with moles urea, which is good, that's what we want. 
And then as always, we have sig figs to worry about. There are three sig figs. three sig figs in this. These mole ratios are exact. So you don't pay attention to them when you're looking at sig figs. And so that means that we should have three digits in our final answer. So 2.63 moles urea is my final answer here. Okay, so that was jumping from our reactant side of our chemical equation we wanted to go from the amount of ammonia to the amount of urea, right? And again, kind of how you would think about it is that's how much urea would be produced if 5.25 moles of ammonia were consumed, all right? Because I'm going from reactants to products. This next reaction, or this next problem, asked me to determine the stoichiometric amount of carbon dioxide required to react with 5.25 moles of ammonia. So now these are on the same side, they're both reactants. And so it's asking if 5.25 moles of ammonia are consumed, how much carbon dioxide is going to be consumed as well, right? Anything on the reactant side gets consumed, anything on the product side gets produced. Mathematically, the way that we set it up is the exact same uh, as we did before. We're gonna start out with the amount of ammonia we have, moles ammonia, and now we're going to use the mole ratio we get from our balanced chemical equation, which says that there are two moles of ammonia consumed per mole of CO2 consumed. So again, I'm gonna punch that into my calculator. I get six, uh, 2.625. I'm going to go back and pay attention to units. Moles of ammonia cancel out. I'm left with moles of CO2, which is good. That's what I want. And then I'm going to go through and pay attention to sig figs. I have three sig figs here. I don't have to pay attention to mole ratios when I'm doing my sig figs. So that means I should have three sig figs. My final answer, so 2.63 moles of CO2. Okay, so this is all about using that information that you get from your balanced chemical equations. All right, now, if uh, we had a mole counting machine in the lab, we would never ba bother with the balances. We wouldn't even worry about measuring things in grams and molar masses and all that good stuff, because what chemists really care about is moles. Unfortunately, there's no such thing as a mole counting machine. And so that's why we have to use our balances to measure out how much of a particular substance we have. So practically speaking, um, what's most common is to start out with the quantity, not in moles, but in grams. And then you have to, so you start out with the mass of your reactants, and then you have to convert to moles of reactants using that molar mass, right? Because molar mass is how we jump from grams to moles. Then just like we saw before, we can jump from moles of reactant to moles of product using that mole ratio. The textbook calls it a stoichiometric conversion factor. I simply refer to it as a mole ratio. And then we can get the mass of product because again, that's what we can really measure with our balances by multiplying by the molar mass of the product. Okay, so this is gonna be the same thing as before, but instead of talking about these quantities in moles, we're gonna be talking about them in grams, which means that we're gonna have this extra conversion step where we gotta jump from grams to moles using the molar mass. Okay, so calculate the, uh, so first of all, nitrous oxide or dinitrogen monoxide is also known as laughing gas, and it's used as an aesthetic, uh, anesthetic in dentistry. It's manufactured by heating ammonium nitrate. Okay, so if we heat ammonium nitrate, we get nitrous oxide and water. So it wants us to calculate the amount, uh, the mass of ammonium nitrate that must be heated in order to produce 10 grams of the nitrous oxide, right? So I have 10 grams of the nitrous oxide. So I know how much product I have. The question is how much of my starting reactant was consumed in order to get that much product. And we're gonna use our balanced chemical equation just as we did before, okay? But 
I can only use my balance chemical equation after I've converted to moles. So the first thing I'm gonna to have to do is start off with my 10 grams oops, of N2O, and I'm gonna to have to convert to moles using the molar mass. So I'm gonna tell you the molar mass of N2O. Um, you should verify using our periodic table that you know how we got this quantity, right? So you have to look it up for nitrogen, and for oxygen, it's N2O, so it would be this number times two plus the number for oxygen. Um, make sure that you get the same value that I get. Calculating molar masses is gonna be really important. Uh, so for the sake of time, I'm gonna give them to you in this particular problem, but uh, you should know how to calculate them. Okay, so this is 44.01288. Grams per mole. And remember, I always carry every single digit I get from the periodic table. We don't want to round everything off. That's a great way to get some error. So, in order to go from grams to moles, I'm going to use my molar mass, which tells me that 44.01288 grams of N2O are in one mole of N2O. So, if I stopped here, I'd have how many moles of uh, this laughing gas was produced, right? Now I want to jump from one quantity on my chemical equation to another, which means that I'm going to use that mole ratio. In this case, it's just one to one. So one mole of N2O would give me one mole of NH4NO3. Okay, so if I stop there, I'd have how many moles of my ammonium nitrate were consumed, but it asked me for the mass of ammonium nitrate, which means that I'm going to need to use the molar mass in order to jump from moles to grams. So again, uh, I would be able to calculate this by looking at the periodic table. I'm going to go fast, just uh, or give it to you rather, just for the sake of time. 80.0. So now, remember, you want to be able to take this information and use it as a conversion factor. In this case, I'm going to start off with moles on the bottom so that that cancels out. NH4NO3 is 80.04344 grams ammonium nitrate. Um, notice how, so first of all, uh, I want to point out one thing real quick. Notice how I'm labeling not just moles, but moles of ammonium nitrate, not just grams, but gram, that wasn't ammonium nitrate, sorry, not just moles, but moles of um, laughing gas or nitrous oxide, not just grams, but grams of nitrous oxide, right? Because this is a great way to keep your quantities straight. I know that everybody's keen on writing less. And so it's really tempting to uh, try to abbreviate and write as little as possible. Trust me when I say that paying attention to units is the most important part of stoichiometry. So yes, it takes a little bit more writing to write moles N2O as opposed to just moles. But trust me, it's a great way to keep this straight and an easy way to avoid making stupid mistakes. Okay, so I set this all up and I didn't do it in multiple steps. I always line it all up in once and get in the habit of punching it into your calculator all at once. You can do these in individual steps. I could stop here, you know, stop, ignore this part and first calculate moles, then include this term and then calculate, uh, get to moles of uh, ammonium nitrate. But if you get in the habit of punching it into your calculator all in one shot, number one, you'll save time right, because you're not writing down the number that you get from each individual step. Number two, it's, a, it's much more likely that you won't make a stupid mistake. Doing it in multiple steps, people are very, it, it's quite common that somebody forgets a number or forgets a digit somewhere and it messes everything up down the line. If you get in the habit of punching this into your calculator, 10 divided by 44.01288, times one divided by one, you don't even have to include that, right? Because it's the same number, times 80.04344 grams. Punch it into your calculator all in one line, and it's a great way to avoid making any sort of mistakes. 
So in this case, I get 18.1863. 18. Six three six. I'm going to go back and make sure that everything cancels out nicely. I have grams of N2O that cancel out. I have moles of N2O that cancel out. I have moles of ammonium nitrate that cancel out. And I'm left with grams ammonium nitrate, which is what I wanted. And then of course, this is a chemistry problem. So I got to think about sig figs. I carried all my digits for my molar masses. So that's not going to limit me. And my mole ratios never limit me. So in this case, all I have to pay attention to the, is the fact that I started out with three sig figs over here. And so I should end with three sig figs. So my final answer is 18.2 grams ammonium nitrate, right? That's my final answer. Okay, and I just wanna point out, we started off with that quantity that we were given. The second thing that we've used was a molar mass. And you wanna take a step back and convince yourself that what that helped us do was jump from grams to moles. And I knew to divide by that molar mass so that grams were on the bottom. That next thing I used was the mole ratio that came from my balanced chemical equation that let me jump from one quantity to another. And then lastly, I used another molar mass to convert from moles to grams, right? So in this step, I divided by the molar mass. In the last step here, I multiplied by the molar mass. And again, I know, knew which way to use this conversion factor because I was paying attention to units. Okay, so now let's do part B. Let me get rid of some of my markings here. Okay, I'm, I'm not gonna have enough room, so I'm gonna have to erase this. You can always rewind if you wanna double check. <clears throat> now I want to figure out how much, determine the corresponding mass of water produced in this reaction. So again, I'm saying that I had 10 grams of nitrous oxide that was produced, that's this one here. And I wanna figure out how much water was produced. So I'm gonna jump from one quantity to another. For that, I'm gonna to need to use my balanced chemical equation, okay? So started off again with the 10.0 grams of M2O. In order to use that balanced chemical equation, I need to be in moles. So I'm gonna to need to divide by the molar mass. Again, I know I need to divide in order to get grams and 2O to cancel out. Now I can use the mole ratio that I find from my balanced chemical equation, which tells me that one mole of N2O will be produced along with two moles of H2O. And then lastly, it asks for the mass of water produced. So how am I gonna get from moles of water to the mass of water? I'm again, gonna need to have a molar mass. I'll tell you it, but you should be able to calculate it based on the periodic table. So make sure to double check that you can do so. Zero, one, five. To eight grams per mole. All right, and then importantly, which way am I gonna put my conversion factor? I'm gonna make sure that moles of H2O are on the bottom and that 18.01528 grams of H2O are on the top. And again, I'm not just writing moles and grams, I'm writing grams of H2O over moles of H2O. I'm being very specific. Okay, so again, get, get it in the habit of punching this into your calculator all in one line. 10 divided by 44.01288 times 2 times 18.01528. Punch that into my calculator. I get 8.18636. Go back and paying attention to units. Grams of N2O cancel. Moles of N2O cancel. Moles of H2O cancel. And I'm left with grams of H2O, which is what I want. 
And then because this is a chemistry class, we can't stop there. We have to worry about sig figs. Um, again, because I took all the digits from my periodic table, I'm not gonna have to worry about my molar mass limiting me. Mole ratios are exact, so they never limit. So this is again, three sig figs. I'm gonna have to round this off to eight. Oops. 8.19 grams H2O. That's my final answer. So if 10 grams of nitrous oxide is produced in this reaction, then 8.19 grams of water is produced in this reaction.